welcome everybody. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, uh, I have about an um, hour of stuff to talk to you about, so we're going to leave time for questions. So let's start right in. The, here are Carl and Sophie. In some ways, they look like any other family, and they sure wished they could be like any other family. Um, <clears throat> however, as they learned very quickly, they are not like any other family. They are a blended family or a step family. And step families can be healthy, strong families. However, they are fundamentally different from first time families. The good news is that we know a lot about what works and what doesn't, uh, but what works is really different from a first time family. And unfortunately, this important information has not been very available to you, the general public, nor unfortunately to therapists and clergy and guidance counselors who often don't have any training at all, um, which means you, uh, you get either guidance that's misleading or sometimes even destructive. So I'm glad you're here because this leaves uh, you folks uh, and people who are trying to help using a first time family map to navigate challenges that are really not, uh, it's a little like uh, driving around Los Angeles with a map of Indianapolis. You have a lot of accidents and a lot of wrong turns and you're not gonna feel very good. So I'm really glad you're here. I'm glad you're, um, I'm glad, I'm glad to be here to share all of this with you. So the first thing we need to talk about, oh, this always happens to me. My screen won't go forward. Uh, there we go is what makes family, step families different. <clears throat> so here's Carl with his first wife, Julia. First time couples like Carl and Julia have time together without kids to get close and build some trust. They have time to, to build some shared values, to establish some sense of how we do things. Um, you know, even to learn that Julia hates the way Carl loads the dishwasher. Um, but, you know, after a, a few times it happens over and over, she gets used to it. She still doesn't like it, but it's not a big spike in uh, upset. In a first time family, kids enter this already established couple relationship. And really important for our story, kids in a first time family enter hardwired for attachment to both of their parents and vice versa. <clears throat> in a first time family, the next child and the next enter this already growing network of connection and sense of how we do things. And they enter hardwired uh, for attachment in both directions. And if things go well, both the emotional connections and the shared sense of how we do things grows over time. And here they are seven years later, thousands of details about how we do things uh, and what matter to us no longer need discussion. But suppose things don't go well and there's a divorce. In the United States and probably in Canada, kids usually become part of two single parent families. Um, <clears throat> so this is what it looks like just before Carl starts dating Sophie. And as you can see, Sophie enters as an outsider to all of this, <clears throat> including Carl's ex-wife, Julia. Like most step couples, Sophie and Carl are very much in love, but even a year later, the established deep attachments are here and here between parents and children. And how about the agreements about uh, food, mess, and noise? whether grape nuts is a breakfast food or a form of cardboard, that was one in my family. But again, they're here and here in the parent-child relationships. They are not in the step couple and not between step parents and step kids. This structure makes five major challenges. Kids struggle with losses and loyalty binds and the pace of change. Insider, outsider positions are stuck and they're intense. Um, especially in the step couple relationship. Parenting and step parenting are very different and they both matter a lot. <clears throat> the family needs to build a new culture in the presence of and while respecting already existing cultures. And ex-spouses, another parent, dead or alive, 
is a permanent part of all step families. <clears throat> and for the ex-spouse other parent, an adult they didn't choose is now involved with their kids. So uh, all of these challenges uh, are, uh, are can be intense. Um, however, if you have a map, it helps a lot. But if you're going in expecting to be like a first time family, then it often adds layers of shame and blame to these already uh, substantial challenges. Blended family is the language we used. I used it in my workshop title, but if you've ever lived in a step family, blending is not usually the word that describes daily living. Um, so I do always put it in quotes just to remind us all that it, it expresses often more the wish than the reality of a step family. Step families do come in a lot of different forms. In Carl and Sophie's family, only one adult brings kids. In this step family, both kids bring kids. And as you can see, this happens to be a lesbian family. Right now, um, most families headed by LGBTQ folks are step families. The age of coming out is going down, or at least it was before Trump came into office. Um, uh, and as stigma lifts, we will see more families, first-time families like Tina's uh, first-time family. However, for now, most LGBTQ folks usually have their kids in a heterosexual cisgender uh, family and then come out. Increasingly, parenting couples are not married, including step couples. So that term remarried uh, doesn't describe a good chunk of step families and probably doesn't describe some of you. And for some people, uh, one partner may be a first marriage and the other a second, even if they do get married. We're seeing a lot of new step families that look like this. In the US, the divorce rate is actually at a 40 year low, except for over age 50, where it has doubled. We call this gray divorce, and it is usually or often followed by gray recoupling. The fantasy for these folks is the dog's dead, the kids are out of the house, and it's just us. But here's the reality, and I really only filled in Jane's side because I got tired of trying to figure out how to do it. Um, th these uh, step families have decades of relationships that sometimes even um, intensify the challenges. So you, many of you may be the adult children. You may be Jim and Jody. Um, of uh, many of you, I'm sure, have uh, divorced and recoupled parents. <clears throat> um, and if any of you are this couple or you want to learn more about being the adult children of this couple, there is a chapter in my book, Surviving and Thriving, <clears throat> about later life step families. Step families may be living apart together. L-A-T, it's called. Living in two separate households um, in a loving, committed relationship. This works pretty, really well, actually, for vulnerable kids, like kids on the spectrum, kids with uh, intense ADHD who can't make transitions easily. Um, LAT goes up 50% for uh, later life couples, couples over 50. And what if one parent has died? We are seeing more of this after COVID. Um, Parent-child relationships are forever, so it's the same structure. And sometimes the challenges we're going to talk about are even more intense for kids. All of these forms have in common that at least one parent-child relationship precedes the adult couple relationship. That's what creates these five challenges. I like to talk about three levels of best practices for meeting these challenges. Um, psychoeducation, learning about what's normal, <clears throat> what works and what doesn't. Um, again, straining to be a first time family adds a lot of stress to these five challenges. Um, knowing what, what's normal and what works and what doesn't can help a lot. Interpersonal skills are really key in step families. Successful step couples and struggling step couples face the same challenge, challenges. Successful step couples meet their challenges with better interpersonal skills. They're more able to take a breath when they come up against one of these challenges. They're more able to stay kind and caring when they're upset with each other. And the third level is um, uh, something uh, the therapists would call this an intrapsychic family of origin uh, level. I call it um, healing old bruises. And I explain this level with something I call Papernau's theory, <laughs> brute, start again, Papernau's bruise theory of feelings. 
if I hit my arm in a place where the flesh is um, healthy, it hurts. If I hit it where there's already a bruise, it hurts a different way. And if there is a deep bruise there, you only have to touch it and you're going to get fight, fight, freeze. <clears throat> Painful, un unhealed old bruises in what I call the wrong places can make these challenges really, really difficult. And uh, doing the work to, to heal these uh, bruises can free resources to meet challenges. You're never going to like being a stuck outsider or a stuck insider, but doing some work to heal an old bruise will make it a lot easier for you to pull up what you need to meet the challenge. So in our short time today, I want to give you a good map of these five challenges um, and what works to meet them. Since we're short on time, I'm going to concentrate on this first level of what normal and what works and what doesn't, and we'll touch on the other two. And along the way, I'm going to point out some what I call easy wrong turns <clears throat> for both step family members and therapists. There is a lot of well-meaning advice uh, out there. This, things that might sound right, but turn out to lead you astray. <clears throat> Here are my two books, Surviving and Thriving uh, in Step Family Relationships and the Step Family Handbook. They are unfortunately still some of the best sources of accurate practical information. Um, uh, Surviving and Thriving was written for both uh, clinicians, therapists, and for step family members. Um, step Step Family Handbook starts a little bit earlier. You can see that it's written with my uh, co-author, Karen Bennell, who's a post-divorce co-parenting uh, coach. Um, Step Family Handbook was written uh, just for the public. So it's a breezier, breezier style. It doesn't have much depth around uh, those three levels that I just talked about, mm -hmm. but it'll give you a really good map. Most people uh, that of my clients like both. Um, and by the way, if you're a person who doesn't like to read or you, you have a partner who doesn't like to read, my website, stepfamilyrelationships.com, it, it should be all over your handouts, is full of videos. Some of them are quite short and there's a good hour long one and there are podcasts and interviews. And these both of these books also come in audio book. Okay. Here we go. First challenge. Kids in step family struggle with losses and loyalty binds and the pace of change. <clears throat> For kids, this is a very different experience from this. So what's normal? Some of the information that I am about to share with you may be painful to adults, but if you can take it in and really get where kids are coming from, the good news is adults can make a big difference for how kids adjust to step families. So here's the first, losses. For the adults, a new relationship is a wonderful gift. It's the best thing ever. However, for children, including adult children, mom or dad's new relationship often adds a bunch of losses to an already big pile of losses. First, of course, kids in a step family come from the losses of divorce. <clears throat> including now always missing one of their parents, often having had to move, um, maybe having had to move uh, uh, schools, but just that big change in a family is huge for kids. Plus, study after study is finding that when parents recouple, kids lose time and attention. Now, why is this? First, Adults in love are just as besotted as any teen. They text during dinner. They text while they're doing homework. They talk with their sweetie while they're driving their kids here and there. That feels really lonely for kids. <clears throat> and when the step parent is around, the, new, the parent is pulled toward their new sweetie, who is not the parent of these two kids. So the kids feel uh, the dad uh, turning away. And Zoe says, um, uh, you know, it used to be just us, and now she's always here. <clears throat> Another issue for kids is loyalty binds. A loyalty bind is if I care about, for Alex, if I care about my stepmother, am I being disloyal to my mom? Um, if the adults in both houses are supportive of each other's loyalty binds soften over time. However, 
when the adults in either house are bad mouthing each other or the step parent, loyalty binds become unbearable for kids. Sometimes, even if nobody is bad mouthing, one child is especially distant. Sophie complains that Zoe, her older step, her depth stepdaughter, treats me like a piece of furniture, if that. I'm guessing, I can't see you guys, but I'm guessing if there are step parents here, you've experienced this. She doesn't even look at me, she says to Carl. Um, often that child is especially close to their parents. So Julia uh, and Zoe are very close. Not unusual for an older uh, daughter, by the way, in a single mom family. And so for Zoe, moving towards Sophie is going to feel like more of a loyalty bind. Alex, her younger brother, is going to be available more easily, earlier. But if Julia is having a very hard time and uh, recoupling can be very evocative and scary for the other parent, she may be leaking her pain and anger on Zoe, in which case Zoe may not be able to even look at her stepmother without feeling that she's doing something wrong. Um, that's got, by the way, going to be real, really hard for the stepmom, Sophie. It's very hard when kids don't look at you. And Sophie's going to need some hugs later out of the sight of kids. Step couples are often very physical. It's important to be physical. It's wonderful to be physical. You need to do it out of kids' eyesight. Parents will often say, I want my kids to know what a good relationship looks like. And that's not the kid's experience. The kid's experience often of a step couple's physicality is that it intensifies their loyalty binds and their sense of loss and too much change. So be physical, but do it in private. <clears throat> uh, change. It turns out that for many kids, the adjustment to a step family actually takes longer than the adjustment to a divorce. And as the amount of change goes up, kids' well-being goes down. The problem is the adults are thrilled. They naturally want to move forward and it's often at a pace that's much too fast for kids. It's important to know that age and gender make a big difference. Step families are easier for kids at eight and under. They tend to be easier for boys than girls. They tend to be harder for, uh, it, they tend to be harder for girls and especially hard for 12 and 13 year old girls which was the age my daughter was when I met my second husband. And I hadn't read this research yet, but boy, did we live it. So what works? Adults really can help kids a lot with these challenges. Very often, a step kid who looks manipulative or resistant or badly behaved is a kid having a hard time. One thing that really helps is carving out regular, reliable parent-child time without the step to parent. Sometimes just increase, increasing the amount and quality of parent-child time can uh, ease depression and lower acting out. And parents, make sure this is not multitasking time. This is time when you can really fully pay attention. Kids will do a lot better if the adults can slow way down. Um, the Step Family Handbook, this book has some really good concrete ideas about how to do that, how to go a step at a time. Um, <clears throat> different kids in the same family will go at different paces. Alex is going to be more available to Sophie, um, more able to join in when the family's together. Zoe is, uh, first of all, the girl, second of all, a 12-year-old girl, and third, thir third of all, very, very close to her mom. We're missing that slice here. Um, it's got, Zoe's going to be slower. Zoe's going to need more one-to-one -one time and less family time. Alex is going to be a little more easy coming along. Easy wrong turn. Couples therapists will often say, make your couple relationship primary. If the couple's okay, the kids will be okay. This is often true in a first time family. Uh, but in step families, actually, when step couples are very close, we see poorer well being in kids. And I think it's because uh, parents have turned away a little bit too much and kids don't have that parent child, what we call attachment that they absolutely need. So it is very, very important to nurture uh, couple relationships in uh, a step family. However, it's both and not either or. Both parent-child relationships and couple relationships need time alone, need uh, quality time. And as we're gonna learn in a minute, also step-parent, step-child relationships 
need some time alone. <clears throat> and step parents, give yourselves a break. Um, the outsider position can be exhausting and painful. Go play with a friend. Go see your Aunt Grace who adores you. Take a long book uh, bike ride. Join a book, book club that gets you out once or twice a week. Um, you or your partner may feel this is not family-like, but um, step parents need a break. You need a break so you can come back. Loyalty binds. Easing loyalty binds is key for kids. Don't put kids in the middle ever. Don't pass messages through kids. Do complain to your friends and your barber. Uh, do not complain to your kids about your ex or the step parent in the other house. And do complain to your partner, but behind closed doors and quietly. Kids hear everything. <clears throat> If loyalty binds are fairly soft, you have a bunch of handouts and handouts number number six is what I call a loyalty bind uh, talk. The core of a loyalty bind talk is um, maybe Carl or is saying to his kids, um, your mom's place in your heart and your place in your mom's heart is permanent, like the sun, like the mountains. Um, Anybody can do a loyalty bind talk. Sophie can, Julia can, grandma can, next door neighbor can, clergy can. A loyalty bind is, talk is going to help Alex a little more because his loyalty bind is soft than it will Zoe, whose loyalty bind is tighter. There is often a big piece of interpersonal skills work here for parents. The best medicine for a dysregulated, upset kid is a grounded, empathic parent who gets it. And all of us know that. That's what we need when we're upset. We don't need anybody to give us advice or tell us it's not a big deal. But that is easier said than done for parents. First, it requires that we turn toward our kids' pain. It's not easy for most of us to do that. So when Zoe says to Carl, I hate Sophie, how easy for Carl to say, oh, she's a nice person. When what Sophie needs, what Zoe needs most is, sounds like you're having a really tough time, sweetie. Say some more. And if he's learned a little bit about, about step families, Carl might be able to say to Zoe, lots of changes, huh? Hard having a new person around and give her a chance to talk. And Carl's job is to listen. This is still one of my very, very all time favorite books about parenting. <clears throat> Great primer for really listening to kids' feelings. All right, second challenge. Insider outsider positions are intense. And they're stuck. Step family structure keeps them stuck. And this is especially true in the step couple. In a step family, remember that the older, more established attachments are here between parents and kids. And so are the agreements about how we do things. So the way how, this is how this plays out. If I'm Carl and one of you is Sophie and my daughter Zoe gets off the bus and Zoe has either made the soccer team or she hasn't made the soccer team. P step parents are very important to uh, kids. We're gonna hear a little more about that in a moment. However, if I'm Zoe, my secure base is my daddy and he's the one I wanna tell. So Zoe bursts in and just before she bursts in, Sophie and Carl are talking. If I'm Carl and you're Sophie, you finally got my full attention and we're chatting. Inverse Zoe saying, daddy, daddy, daddy. Now I'm a good parent, what do I do? I turn away towards my kid. And where does that leave Sophie? It leaves Sophie standing alone. Um, in a first time family, Zoe is more likely to need both of us. And even if she only needs one of us, we both have in our bodies, the experience of having held Zoe as a baby, having her looked adoringly at us and uh, feeling totally gaga in love. Step parents don't have that to get through these moments. <clears throat> this is Stephen Porges, he's a neurobiologist. We're wired to expect that people close to us won't turn their backs on us. And uh, <clears throat> when they do, it's upsetting. So as we're gonna see in a minute, step parents are very important to kids, but parents are the comfort anchor. So in step families, when parents care for their kids, they often have to turn away from step parents. So step parents like Sophie are left out over and over. She's a stuck outsider day in and day out. It is perfectly normal 
for step parents to feel invisible and rejected. Parents are stuck insiders. When I turn to my daughter, my sweetie's upset. But if I turn to my sweetie and told my daughter, wait a minute, my daughter would be upset. And um, if I keep the peace with my ex-wife, my sweetie is upset and vice versa. So stuck insiders often feel torn between the people that were important to them. They can't please them all. And so stuck insiders often feel anxious, inadequate, and they may often get defensive just at a moment when stuck outsiders really need their empathy and compassion. In double step families, often one of the adults is more of a stuck outsider and one's more of a stuck insider. So Olivia and Tina both have kids, but Olivia's daughter, Lisa, is six, a much easier age for kids in step families. And Lisa's an outgoing, friendly kid. So she's pretty friendly and playful with her stepmother. So when these three are together, Lisa's still closer to her mom than she is to Tina, her stepmom. But Tina feels seen and known um, and part of the scene. Tina's son, Tommy, is a totally different story. First of all, he's an adolescent, much tougher age for entering a step family. He's really shy and noisy Lisa and Olivia are completely overwhelming to him. In fact, Tommy does not need a new step family at all. He needs time alone with his mom. <clears throat> so Tina gets this and she does spend lots of alone time with Tommy and that helps him a lot. But when Tommy is in the house, Olivia is an almost complete stuck outsider. And um, <clears throat> uh, Olivia is going to need a, a bunch of hugs later out of Tommy's eyesight. And she's going to need Tina to really get what this feels like. Tina's going to need Olivia to get what it's like to feel torn between her son and her sweetie. Stigma and different levels of outness can add another layer of insider and outsiderness in LGBTQ families. Um, and in the United States, in a Latinx family, where we have a, one, uh, a step parent who is uh, undocumented, that, that person is going to be a double outsider. In this family, <clears throat> uh, Tina's been out since her late teens. She's, uh, her family had trouble, but is now fully accepting. She is deeply part of the gay community. Um, so when Lisa uh, when, and her mom need to spend time together, Tina has other places to turn outside the family. Olivia, however, just came out, whoops, sorry, just came out a few years ago <clears throat> from a heterosexual marriage. Her Catholic family is very rejecting. Um, so when Tommy needs his mom, Olivia has no other adults to turn to. So helping Olivia and Tina uh, uh, later or early in the morning behind closed doors hold hands about this will be important. And getting Olivia better connected in the gay community will also be important for this family. Kids can be stuck insiders and outsiders too. Lisa lives in this family full time. Tommy comes in um, every other week. And for Lisa, it's like, who's this strange, weird kid who likes to watch these weird TV programs? Um, Tommy lives half time with each of his moms. He comes in each week as an outsider. Plus he's very uh, shy, remember. Um, plus Lisa gets much more time with Tommy's mom than Tommy does. So stuck outsider kids often feel like I don't belong in this family. Um, this isn't my family. Easy for mom, for mom to want to say, yes, you do. This is your family. When again, what Tommy mostly needs is Oh, sweetie, tell me more. <clears throat> okay, what works to meet these insider-outsider challenges? I just talked a little bit about what might help Tommy. <clears throat> for for step-parents especially, and for parents, it's really helpful to know that these painful insider and outsider feelings aren't happening because you're failing. They aren't happening because you don't love each other. They are normal responses to step family structure. <clears throat> and again, one key for meeting this challenge is lots of one-to-one -one time. Step families do need to spend time together as a family, doing fun things together, um, 
uh, you know, beginning to develop a sense of us. However, every time the whole family is together, all of the challenges we're going to talk about, but especially this one, are much more intense. So carving out one-to-one -one time for the adult step couple so that there is time when the step parent can be the insider, where the parent can pay full attention without feeling like they're turning away from their kid. Um, Parent-child time, as we just saw, is just as important. And as we're going to see, step-parent, step-child time uh, to build their new relationship without the parent present is also important. When the parent's present, uh, step-parent's an outsider again. When the parent is not present, step-parent and step-child can turn towards each other. <clears throat> For step-couples, staying connected across this insider-outsider divide can be quite challenging. You're going to need to find ways to pull each other close when it will be easy to either shut down or push each other away. You have a handout, handout number two. Um, again, successful step couples and uh, struggling step couples have to face the same challenges. In handout number two, successful step couples have better skills. And this is um, one of my lists of favorites. They're all really described in the blue book, Surviving and Thriving and Step Family Relationships. But I'm just going to whip through these. Take a minute to notice, are there some of these that you do well? Pat yourself on the back and keep doing them. Are there one or two you'd like to try? See if you can pick out one or two you'd like to try. The first is take a breath. <clears throat> Get calm before you talk. Uh, John Gottman, longtime researcher on what he calls master couples versus disaster couples. John says the most important interpersonal skill is self-regulation. Soft and tender works a lot better than hard and harsh. So I can say to my husband, honey, you're an idiot and say it sweetly. Or I can say, why'd you do that sharply? <clears throat> Turn criticisms into positive requests. The criticisms will come fast. You're going to have to take a breath and use a little muscle often. But think about it. Which could you respond more easily to if Sophie says, you always leave me out? Or, honey, I'd really love a hug. Which would be easier to respond to? And again, it takes some muscle to get yourself from a criticism into a, a request. <clears throat> This is an old one. Stick to I messages. Avoid you messages. Your daughter is a rude brat is a you message with a label. Sweetie, I'm having a hard time. Can we talk is an I message about the same events. And by the way, labels come easy. She's a rude brat, but they almost guarantee defensiveness. Often, this is not in your handout. Uh, somebody will say, but it's the truth. And here's what I say. The truth without kindness is not communication. It's a weapon. There's no guarantee that these five things, these, this list is going to get you what you're looking for, but the chances go way up. Another one from John Gottman, successful couples have a five to one positive to negative count. And by the way, in the same uh, experience, successful couples are able to find the positive uh, struggling couples look only for the negative. So count how what came out of my mouth today, how much of it is negative? Can I add some positive? <clears throat> this one's really important. Repair. We're all going to goof. Can you say, I'm sorry I was sharp yesterday and not, I'm sorry I was sharp, but you did such and such. I'm. That's not a repair. I'm sorry I was sharp is a repair and it can make a big difference. And when in doubt, Use sentence stems. They're like structures that help you do this well. It's hard for me that. I love it if. <clears throat> On this old bruise level, nobody likes being left out. Nobody likes being torn between people who are important to you. These stuck insider and stuck outsider positions are very can be very painful to all humans. That's the way we're wired. However, if you grew up in a family where you were the stuck outsider, maybe an older brother got all the attention, you had a younger sister who was bipolar, uh, somebody uh, raped you or touched you inappropriately and nobody paid attention, that outsider position is going to be much more painful. If you were the stuck insider, which is what I was in my family, I was the peacemaker in my family, I did fine in my first step family, my husband had two kids, 
um, in my second, and then I had a child with him in my second step family. I was the stuck inside. I was much more anxious about trying to please everybody. So if you have bruises there, getting some help for them can make a big difference in your ability to show up for these, these kinds of challenges. This is, this next challenge is really key for a step family success. <clears throat> and this cool parenting styles chart, which you have in your handouts, <clears throat> is really helpful for this. I get my watch. This chart says that parenting goes from warm to cold and from firm to permissive. It makes four parenting styles. Um, you can read a lot more about this in actually both books. Um, and hands down, this parenting style, authoritative, uh, is uh, better for kids, better for mental health, better for physical health, academics, drug use, you, you name it. Um, uh, <clears throat> because this challenge is so, so easy to get wrong with such uh, difficult consequences, I'm going to start on this challenge with what works. We have lots and lots of research about this, about what works for parenting and step parenting and discipline and step families. And we're learning more and more every, almost every month. Most important, parents need to retain the disciplinary role. Um, <clears throat> step parents often expect and are expected to step into discipline. It doesn't work. Um, what works for step parents is to focus on connection, not correction, on making relationships, not rules, leading with warmth, not control. Concentrate on getting to know your step kid. Find some fun, easy, low key, one to one uh, activities together. Um, <clears throat> it turns out that shy Tommy loves basketball. Olivia was captain of her basketball team. These two guys can shoot baskets. He doesn't have to talk. He doesn't have to be warm with her, but that be helps them begin to make a relationship and they start shooting hoops together. Authoritarian, that upper right, that's this, um, authoritarian, hard and cold parenting by step parents is almost always toxic in step parent, step child relationships. And unfortunately, it's easy for step parents. This is leading with high control and low warmth. And by the way, even cultures that value authoritarian parenting, um, this doesn't work in step parent, step child relationships. Over time, when kids feel they've developed a caring, trusting relationship with their step parent, step parents can sometimes move into authoritative, leading with warmth and calm, moderate discipline, authoritative parenting. Again, that's this upper left. However, uh, even authoritative parenting in step families too early can backfire. And there are many, many thriving step families where step parents have a very good relationship with their step kids, but they do not have a disciplinary role. And this is especially likely if kids are older when you start. <clears throat> A very, very easy wrong turn is that step couples are told to have the parent back up the step parents' discipline. And this makes some logical sense and step parents like it, but it pulls step parents prematurely into discipline. Successful step couples do talk a lot about parenting and discipline. Step parents do need to have a voice. They often have a lot of input but parents need to have final say about their own kids. <clears throat> and it is the parent who will actually set the limits on a kid. <clears throat> and what about if the parent isn't there? If Carl isn't there, he says to the kids, I'm out for the evening at my board meeting. Sophie's in charge. No social media before you finished homework. You know the rule. And if Zoe starts texting, Sophie says to Zoe, you know, the rule is no social media before homework. I want to give your dad a good report. And she says this in a friendly, friendly, calm tone. Um, up to you. Um, if she stays on her texting, she says she could repeat it, just so you know. Um, and then Sophie's going to call, tell Carl, and it is Carl's call how to follow through with Zoe. <clears throat> but here's what makes this challenge so hard for parents and step-parents. I have now taught all over the world. 
And my experience is that step parents everywhere want more limits and boundaries with their step kids and parents everywhere want more love and understanding for their kids. And why is this? Um, parents have that experience again in their bodies of adoring their kids. They have shared understandings about what's okay and what's not. Step parents don't. And how much more irritating for Sophie, did I lose Sophie here? Yeah, how much more irritating for Sophie if it's Zoe who barely says hello to Sophie and it's Zoe who leaves the mess, much more upsetting to, to Sophie. So when this gets bad, parents get pulled down, well, step parents get pulled up here. Your kid's a slob, she's leaving a mess. Parents get pulled down here, getting more and more protected. Oh, she's just a kid. She, I mean, it's not a big deal. She gets more frustrated. She gets more uh, authoritarian. He gets more per permissive. What kids need is this from dad. And they sure don't need this from stepmom. What they actually need is something like this, but we call it supportive from step parents. And when this goes badly, I call it the polarization pol polka. And um, some of you have probably doing this dance. Carl keeps saying they're just being kids. She gets more and more frustrated. And um, uh, every time there's a, a conversation, they get caught in this. When this goes well, I call it, it's more of a collaborative cha-cha. Step parents are able to pull parents up into a little more firmness. Parents are able to pull step parents over into a little more warmth. So, and that's that my, what I call the collaborative cha-cha. And here's what it looks like. Olivia's daughter, Lisa, has a set of chores. She's only six, but she has a set of chores. Um, she is supposed to take her dishes into the kitchen after dinner. That's one of them. Tommy has no chores. He eats dinner, gets up, leaves the table, and goes to his room. Olivia is not too happy about this. She'd like Tommy to do the dishes. He's 14, after all. But she waits for a, skill, a, a moment when she's calm. She waits for a moment when she and Tina are alone together having coffee. Olivia reaches for Tina's hand and says, sweetie, can we talk about something? Can we have Tommy to pitch in and do the dinner dishes? What do you think? And Tina sighs and says, oh, honey, I don't know. He's so overwhelmed with his new family. I'm afraid he'll stop coming over if we ask too much of him. Now, Olivia's disappointed. She doesn't up the ante. She takes a breath. And she waits. And then she says softly, I know, I know this is really hard for him, honey, but I still think we could ask a little more of him. He's 14, don't you think? And Tina says, well, you're right. I don't ask much of anything of him. <laughs> um, and she takes a breath. And finally, Tina says, how about we ask Tommy to clear the table at dinner time?" And Olivia says, deal. Now it's Tina who's going to tell Tommy that he needs to clear the table at dinner time. And by the way, when Tommy says, that was Olivia's idea, Tina can say, actually it was, but I think you're old enough to do this now, don't you? <clears throat> Here's the good news. And by the way, just notice, um, Olivia pulled Tina into a little more firmness and Tina pulled uh, Olivia into a little more warmth and understanding. Really good news. Positive step-parent, step-child relationships matter a lot. <clears throat> they make for better physical and emotional health for kids and also better couple relationships, not surprisingly. And we're learning that there is a very wide range of step-parent roles that work. As long as step-parents can lead with warmth and low control. <clears throat> so here's here's the range. Some step parents are very, very emotionally involved, more likely with step moms and step dads. Some step parents primarily focus on academics. And step, some step parents are much more casual, still warm though. They're not leaning with control, they're leaning with warmth. And it might be everyday talk about school or sports. It might be shooting baskets, the way Olivia and Tommy are starting to do. It might be playing games together. This whole range of positive step-parent, step-child relationships is linked to higher well-being in kids. Lower well-being is linked to author that authoritarian, negative, harsh parenting we just talked about. And cold, distant step-parent, step-child relationships are also linked to poorer mental and physical health, except the finding is that cold, distant, absent step-parent, step-child relationships are often in a family where there is more 
uh, distance between the couple and between the parent and child as well. So on their skills level, successful step couples, again, do need to work as a team. They talk a lot about parenting and discipline, but to do it well, given that pull to the polarization polka, they need good skills. Same set, same handout too. <clears throat> and I'm just gonna add one more. This is one of my all time favorites. And this is handout number five. Oops, it says seven on here. I uh, yes, it's probably seven. Um, Think of something hard you want to say. Just take a moment to do this. But before you say it, look for something soft. So it might be, I love you. It might be, we can do this. I think we can do this together. It might be, I know you're working on getting the kids to clean up more. Or it might be empathy. I know your kids aren't used to picking up. Then say the hard thing, but say it with that soft energy. And if you can use some of the skills we just listed, that will go a lot better. And find another soft. <clears throat> so uh, 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 when Olivia came back to Tina, when Tina was disappointing, Olivia said, I know this is hard for Tommy. I get what you're saying. And, and she said it very softly. Um, <clears throat> my experience is that um, even uh, my clients who have a really hard time uh, really listening to each other can do this one. Okay, I'm actually gonna, I was gonna stop for questions, but we're a little late. So I'm actually gonna keep going and we'll have questions at the end. <clears throat> um, oh, very important. Step parents do not have to be silent when they're upset with step kids. They do have to express themselves in ways that build connection, not connection. Cause these are fragile new relationships. And as the dad who asked the question early on, uh, uh, kids are often having trouble with step parents, so step parents need to navigate with their best skills, not they work, not their worst. Even in situations that pull for their worst. So, if you're a step parent, again, take a look here. Choose one or two to work on. And soft heart, soft and sentence stems, by the way, are always a good sort of go tos. <clears throat> okay. Next challenge: family culture. <clears throat> new step families have to build a shared culture, a new shared culture. Um, but they've got at least two existing cultures. <clears throat> on. Um, lost my place. Because in a step family, what's a shared noise? Uh, what's an okay amount of money to pay for, for uh, a pair of sneakers? What's an appropriate cost of a haircut? They are shared here and here, not in the step couple relationship and not between step parents and step kids. So this family has its first Christmas together. Sophie happily hangs white lights on the Christmas tree. She's so excited. It's their first Christmas. Zoe, comes downstairs. She takes one look at these white lights and she bursts into tears. She's used to colored lights. And this is one too many changes at an important, really important time. Changes at holidays can be especially intense. And she goes to her room, slams the door and refuses to come out. So if this goes badly. Sophie thinks Zoe has ruined Christmas. Zoe gets that, I mean, uh, Carl gets why his daughter is upset but he's frozen in his insider position. Zoe, Zoe is left alone in her room crying. She calls her mom and they agree that Sophie's a witch. I mean, who would ever call white lights on a tree? Ridiculous. If this goes well, Carl pulls Sophie maybe into the pantry and gives her a hug. Sophie sits down with Alex and maybe the two of them play a game. <clears throat> Carl goes to Zoe he walks into her room and she is sobbing and he just puts her arms around her. And Carl takes a breath. He keeps himself from saying, oh, what's the big deal? He puts his arm around his daughter and says, oh, sweetie, this was too hard. And again, if he's learned a little bit about his step families, he knows what's happening. This was too many changes too fast. This was a big change, huh, sweetie? Sophie didn't know, but it was a big, big change for you. And if he sits there with her long enough, she's going to calm down. 
And later, if this goes well, this whole family could gather, whoops, I'm sorry, could gather around for a cocoa and tell each other stories about the Christmas trees they grew up with. In step families, we have to do that on purpose because we don't have those shared stories. And by the way, of, of my clients have worked out this tree problem um, many, many different ways. I had one family that decorated the tree half with white lights and half with uh, colored lights. Sometimes they did it vertically and sometimes they did it horizontally. I had a family that had two trees and then they had three trees, an us tree, a them tree, and an our tree. Um, uh, once, once you calm down and are able to listen to each other, there are usually some creative ways through these things. So what works? A little more about work. First of all, we got to change the metaphor. Making a step family is not like putting frozen blueberries and frozen strawberries together and making a smoothie. It's a lot more like putting a group of Japanese together with a group of Italians and saying, live together and make a family. You know, the Italians are going to come in and slap everybody on the back. That is going to feel aggressive to the Japanese, friendly to the Italians. The Japanese are going to be more formal and more contained. That is going to feel uh, uh, kind and respectful to the Japanese and cold to the Italians. And it's going to take time, lots of time, to get to know each other and be able to read each other. So something I call learning by goofing is part of this. That's what happened with Sophie and Zoe and the Christmas tree lights. It's learning by goofing. <clears throat> we're going to make a lot of mistakes and these uh, mistakes are not a sign of failure they are a hard way to learn because there's this spike of upset when zoe looked at the tree and when sophie uh heard zoe being uh, so upset so you have to ride through that spike of upset <sighs> calm yourself down before you can figure out what to do next and learn about each other taking things a step at a time helps a lot um, you know, if uh, Carl and Sophie had met a month before and now they're doing Christmas together, that would probably have been way, way, way too fast. Because remember, as the pace of change goes up, kids' well-being goes down. Keep familiar routines in place as much as possible. In double families, that may mean two sets of rules for now. Tommy is allowed to drink Coke with his lunch. Lisa uh, Olivia wants Lisa to drink milk. Lisa looks over at Tommy over lunch and says, that's not fair. Why does he get to drink Coke? And Olivia says calmly, caringly. Yeah, I know, sweetie. These differences are tough, huh? You know where Tommy comes from? They drink Coke with lunch. We drink milk with meals. When you grow up, you can decide which is better for kids. And notice um, Olivia didn't say, uh, a Coke is bad for you. She didn't say anything like that. She just said, uh, when you grow up, you can make a decision. This is how we do it. Easy wrong turn. Step couples and double families are often advised to make a whole new set of family rules. And this does actually sound logical, especially if you have teenagers, but it's much too much change too fast for kids. It's a little like trying to solve those differences between Japanese and Italians by making everybody eat pasta with chopsticks. That's going to be a lot more misery than it is going to make unity. So what do you do? I suggest start with two or three really important rules and start with rules for safety and civility. It's really important to keep everybody safe. And in double families, by the way, this is not the time to let kids work it out. Really important. If kids are having a trouble, trouble step kids, step sibs separate them as much as you can and it may be hard and it may be disappointing to the couple who would like to spend Saturday as a family but really it's going to work better if dad goes with his kids and mom goes with and stepmom goes with her kids um in double families it is important to be aware that what may seem like a easy rule to one side of the family as actually asking a lot of the other so be aware of what you're asking for instance um, it is second nature in Tommy's two families that you knock before entering. Um, Lisa and Olivia um, are in and out of each other's room, were before they lived with uh, Tina, in and out of each other's rooms, rooms all the time. And so it's going to take Lisa and Olivia a lot more practice to knock before entering rather than just barge in than it will Tommy. Fifth challenge, 
Last but not least, <clears throat> there is another parent, dead or alive, who is a permanent part of all step families. And for the ex-spouse parent in the other family, there is an adult they did not choose and cannot supervise involved with their kids. We do see slightly poorer outcomes for kids in divorce. However, it turns out that what makes the difference is conflict and tension and poorer parenting. Um, children with low conflict, divorced parents are doing significantly better than children with high conflict, never divorced parents. <clears throat> and this includes young adult and adult children and it turns out that adult young women especially have a hard time when their parents are in conflict. And the research is these are not just guns and knives and screaming and yelling, even moderate tension in parental relationships lowers kids' attention, it lowers their academics, and it compromises their immune systems. So this is really important. And it takes a lot of muscle sometimes if you're in a high conflict ex-spouse relationship. Um, to, to do this well. So really important that we monitor the level of conflict and tension that we're exposing kids to, and this includes adult kids. The same way that docs monitor blood pressure, my hunch is some, most of you are younger than I am, but docs monitor, they take our blood pressure every single time we're in the office. And I'll bet that's also true of you younger, younger ones as well. And they fix it with urgency. They don't let it go on. The same is true for conflict and tension with kids. So remembering really important, at least on your side, the, your ex may be doing these things, but that you don't put kids in the middle, that you don't pass messages through kids, that you protect kids. You talk really quietly when you need to uh, complain about your ex. Um, very cooperative post-divorce co-parenting is the very best for kids. For most kids, low conflict parallel parenting is the next and it's best and it's the most common. Except we have an exception here for special needs kids. Kids who are on the spectrum, uh, autism spectrum, kids with ADHD, a very depressed or suicidal teen needs much more cooperative, consistent co-parenting across households. <laughs> And often, by the way, um, these these co-parents are in quite a lot of conflict. So um, th that tends to be much, much harder on these kids than on other kids. The two houses don't have to be exactly the same. But the, the best for these kids, that there is a good amount of consistency between the two houses, especially for kids on the spectrum and kids with the ADHD. And for, if there is a de very depressed teen, very important that in both houses, the adults are tuned in, emotionally tuned in. Depressed teens don't always let you know what's going on. They're highly tuned into what's happening with the kids. Again, important to remember that recoupling can be very hard on the ex-spouse parenting. So just really very practically, um, if you're Sophie and you have a very triggered ex-spouse parent <clears throat> and you guys are at a basketball game together or a play together um, and Sophie uh, wants to show Julia that she really loves Alex and Zoe. But as soon as Sophie puts her arms around Alex and Zoe, Julia's going to go crazy. So at these times, if you got a triggered ex-spouse, step parent, step back, step into the background let the parent step forward, not the time to, to um, be a slathering love and attention on your stepkids. And step parents, if that's hard, make sure you get a, a good hug later from your partner or that you, you're holding hands, maybe sitting behind the kids where they don't see. <clears throat> a triggered ex-spouse is toxic for everybody. So anything you can do to lower that triggering, even it may cost you some, but um, it will be better for you and everybody. Generally, rules between houses don't have to be the same. You heard about Tommy's allowed to drink. Um, well, actually, no, that's that was a different one. Tommy says, Mama lets me watch, Mama in his other house, lets me watch TV on school nights. And Tina says, yep, in this house, we would just watch on weekends. Uh, 
in your mama's house, you can watch on school nights. When you grow up, you can decide which is best for your kids. And notice Tina is not saying your mama never did have put you to bed on time on school nights. Your mama never did have a sense of what works on. She says, yeah, you got two houses. They're different. Um, here's what we do here. When you grow up, you can decide what's better. And again, uh, oops, uh, special needs kids are an exception here. Kids on the spectrum, kids with ADHD um, are going to need uh, more consistency, at least some, not all rules have to be the same, but so, uh, a good bunch of rules that are pretty much the same, pretty much uh, this is how we do it um, so that, that there are not, not, uh, not a lot of surprises. <clears throat> So what about navigating different value systems between homes? How to do it in ways that don't tighten loyalty binds. <clears throat> um, I have a colleague with a 10-year-old stepdaughter who came back from her mom's house saying, gays are an abomination. <clears throat> it happens that this colleague has lots of gay friends who this kid has met. Uh, but how does she respond? And this is what my colleague did. She said calmly and very lovingly, now, that's what one side of your family believes. There are lots of different opinions and beliefs. This is what we believe. We believe that gay and lesbian and transgender folks, like our friends Ella and Jane and Tom and Gary, are people just like us. And we want you to have your own opinions and beliefs. But we all agree, both houses agree, you have to be treat people the way you want to be treated. What if the other parent has died? Again, we're seeing a lot more of this with COVID. In my experience, kids have a tighter loyalty bind uh, sometimes. I've lost my parent. I don't, I'm a, I, I want to hold on to every speck. Um, this, and things get worse when the step parent expects to replace the parent. Totally understandable, except kids don't want a replacement. Parent child relationships are forever. So, ki what kids really need is plenty of room and support to grieve in whatever way they need to grieve their missing parent. And that missing parent needs to be held as part of the family. <clears throat> this, by the way, is one of the true, uh, for only a few, this is one of the few really good evidence based books out there, um, uh, trade books. Uh, this is a good one. And she also has a Facebook page. Back to live-in spou ex-spouses. On behalf of your kids, on behalf of your kids and stepkids, we all need to use our best skills with ex-spouses in situations that often pull for our worst. <clears throat> and as in parenting, oh, these are good books. Um, they're in your uh, reference list. These two, Bill Eddy and Bill Whitman, are good for really high conflict. And these are good for lower conflict. Um, as in parenting, step parents will often want more limits with the ex and more boundaries. Parents have got to keep the peace. How do you both calm down and really listen to each other? <clears throat> and again, what matters most is protecting kids from tension and conflict. Sometimes, by the way, step parents can be a really key resource. Uh, with ex-spouses when it's a very high conflict. This was true in my first marriage. My husband and his ex-wife could not talk without fighting. However, she and I could talk. So she and I actually did the negotiating around holidays and um, those kinds of things. And it worked much better. Um, so ending on a good note, what does it look like when step couples, step families are meeting these challenges? Here are Sophie and Carl and Alex and Zoe as a new step family. The strong attachment bonds and the shared understandings are over here in the parent-child relationships. Sophie and Carl are straining to blend, which leaves them feeling really awful most of the time. Alex is somewhat more available than his sister. So Zoe's strong loyalty bond with her mom makes her extremely different, distant with Sophie. Sophie's arrival on the scene has upped the tension between Carl and Julia. The one thing they've done right is that Carl has handled all of the discipline. However, they're lousy in her personal skills. Their inability to talk without blaming each other and shaming each other, keep miring in them in conflict and moments when they really need to be holding hands across those big divides. Alex is bumping along okay, but Zoe is feeling very alone and depressed. <clears throat> she really needs her dad to get how hard this new family is for her. 
And uh, she really needs him to get her sense of loss and her loyalty bond with her, her mom. And she needs more one-to-one -one time with her dad. Um, here they are seven years down the road. They've gotten some good help. Uh, attachment in the adult couple relationship is now strong. They're much more able to reach for each other kindly and skillfully. They're doing some fun things together as a family. And they're also now carving out one-to-one -one time um, for Carl and the kids, for the couple. And Sophie has begun building a relationship with Alex, especially. Um, the couple still has differences, but they have an increasingly shared sense of how we do things. Typical in this healthy step family, Carl is closer to his kids than Sophie is. There's a woman named Mavis Hetherington who calls this ownness. But the relationship between Sophie and Alex is strong and getting stronger. It, they're, they're in that emotionally involved, very close step-parent, step-child relationship. With some coaching, Sophie and Carl have worked to reassure Julia and they now have a fairly cooperative relationship. This has helped Sophie, Zoe's loyalty bind loosen a little bit. And she's much more available to Sophie than she was. And a year ago, there are turning points all the way along in step-parent, step-child relationships. A year ago, Sophie, a first boyfriend broke up with her and she was heartbroken. Sophie, who'd been alone for 10 years before she met Carl, totally got it better than either Carl or Julia. And that made an opening between Zoe and Sophie. <clears throat> and they are closer than they were. <clears throat> Sophie has moved into an authoritative parenting role with Alex. Carl is still the limit setter with Zoe. Um, Sophie is still more of an outsider. Carl is more of an insider. Sophie still wishes Carl would be firmer sometimes in his parenting, but at this point, they're managing to handle these things with lots of care and connection. Very different from this first-time family and still a thriving, healthy step family. Um, and, you know, for uh, this family took about six or seven years to get here. A family that comes in with a good map and has good interpersonal skills at maybe two or three or four years. Um Bottom line, though, becoming a step family is a process, not an event. Here are my books and my website.